As we saw in the last lecture, people impose narratives onto raw data, and some narratives work better than others. When you first see this polar bear pawing with his dog, you can describe it as petting and imagine, therefore, that the bear is acting like a human. But when you learn a little later uh, that at the same kennel a bear ate a dog, you might question that first narrative. So we still have two interpretations of what is happening, but the new information adds new context. We might want to ignore that context and protect our cute bear pets dog interpretation. And this is how many people approach literature. When you read a text and form an interpretation, you can become attached to it. Uh, when someone else offers a different interpretation, you can say, you know, you have your opinion and I have mine. Uh, in that sense, some people see reading like looking at a Rorschach ink blot. Uh, these were free association tests that psychologists used to use to get people to reveal unconscious thoughts that they might have. In an ink blot test, there are no wrong answers. Whatever it looks like to you, that's the right answer. This one, to me, looks kind of like a schnauzer. You know, maybe it looks like something else to you. Uh, free association is okay when we're reading for personal enjoyment, but you don't need a college class to teach you how to seize the first thought that pops into your mind. In an academic study of literature, we're going to look for context. Uh, we're going to look for historical context, we're going to look for cultural context, and we'll learn to use that context rather than our own personal context to make interpretive claims about a text that can be supported with evidence from the cultures, from those historical periods, uh, from the means of production that generated those texts. Uh, that doesn't mean that there is only one right way to read a particular text. However, it does mean that some claims will have more contextual support than others. We all know who this is, right? Uh, your average person will tell you that this is Frankenstein. A few people may point out that it's actually Frankenstein's monster rather than Frankenstein himself. And so what else do we know about it? Well, we know that the monster was created by Dr. Frankenstein. He was stitched together from the corpses of dead people and brought to life by a bolt of lightning or some sort of electricity. Dr. Frankenstein did all this with the help of his hunchback assistant, Igor, in a laboratory filled with sophisticated machines deep inside Castle Frankenstein. Uh, the result is this slow-moving, slow-thinking, uh, robot-like humanoid that can barely put together a sentence. Uh, these are the first details that come to mind when you ask most people. However, almost none of these elements of the Frankenstein story come from the novel where that story originated. In Mary Shelley's novel, Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus, we're never told how the creature is brought to life. Uh, Shelley never mentions uh, harnessing lightning. Igor does not appear in the novel at all. There's no castle Frankenstein. There is in Switzerland, but there's not in the novel. Um, there's no laboratory. Victor Frankenstein is not Dr. Frankenstein. He hasn't even graduated from college yet. Victor has constructed the creature's body and leaves it lying on a table when he passes out from exhaustion. Uh, when he wakes up, the body's gone. The creature's alive and on the loose, but Victor never even sees it happen, much, much less chant maniacally, it's alive, it's alive. Most of these story elements come from the 1931 movie directed by James Whale that stars Boris Karloff as the creature. Uh, that film is based on a play which was based on Mary Shelley's novel. Each time the story was adopted, uh, it uh, took on new elements. Each new writing and director uh, filled in the gaps, the things that Shelley never mentions. But they also rewrote major elements. And very few of us know the story from seeing the 1931 film. Instead, we've seen adaptations and adaptations of adaptations of adaptations. And these adaptations have added more than just Igor and the lightning machine. They've added a moralistic interpretation, or many moralistic interpretations. Most people will tell you that Frankenstein is about how scientists try to play God, and they meddle with nature and create monsters that only cause destruction. Uh, the, there's a moral of the story, and that's that we shouldn't meddle with nature. Uh, but this is the moral that James Whale's film beats us over the head with. Uh, it's not a very good description of Shelley's novel. In the novel, the only thing Victor Frankenstein really does wrong is reject his creation. At first, everything, is about the, uh, everything about the creature is good, except his appearance. He's faster and stronger than any human being, and he becomes very articulate very quickly. He makes these great speeches, he quotes Milton, and 
uh, Paradise Lost and that sort of thing. He's, he's not a slow-witted sort of robot human. Uh, the only thing he can't do is find someone who will treat him like a human being. People see his appearance and scream at him and call him a monster and attack him. He even gets shot. Uh, eventually he gives up trying to connect with other people and turns to hurting people the way they expected him to. They think he's a monster so he starts to act like a monster. In Shelley's novel, it's not science that creates the monster, it's us. Everyday human beings who react to appearances rather than thinking with open minds. So now that we have all these other story elements, it becomes really difficult not to project them back onto the text when we read that text. It becomes hard to remember what's not there in the original text. So I'm going to read, uh, and I want you to try to remember uh, these words when I uh, take away this card. The words are thread, pin, eye, sewing, sharp, point, prick, Thimble, haystack, thorn, hurt, injection, syringe, cloth, knitting. All right, I'm going to take the card away and see what you can remember. Tell me a yes or no if you heard the following. Did you hear the word thread? Did you hear the word zebra? Did you hear the word needle? Okay, here's what most people say when they're given this uh, task. When asked if they heard the word thread, they say yes. When asked if they heard the word zebra, they say no. When asked if they heard the word needle, they say yes. Now, here's what the correct answer is. Yes, when they, if they said yes to the word thread, they're correct. The word thread was part of that, that list. The word zebra was not part of that list, so if they said no, that's also correct. But here's the one people get wrong. People are asked if they heard the word needle, and they say yes. But, uh, if you look back through that card, you see that it was not, in fact, one of those words. Now, why do people think they heard the word needle, or think they saw the word needle? Well, this is called the, the Deese Rodinger McDermott procedure, uh, and it's designed to do the kind of thing we just saw with Frankenstein and the Lightning Machine test. Uh, we have this tendency toward what psychologists call associative coherence. Uh, so, associative coherence is the, the, the fact that things that we usually experience or think of together as occurring together uh, as, as part uh, as connected somehow uh, we start to uh, assume that they naturally belong together we feel that they ought to be found together even if they're not uh, and this is why all these words that we saw had something to do with the word needle so we assume that needle should have been one of them uh, we assume that the lightning machine should have been in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein All right, well, we're not going to be reading Frankenstein in this class. It comes a few centuries after our time period. Our texts are even older, but that means that they've had, had even more time to accumulate a lot of modern baggage. Uh, one of our texts is the old English poem Beowulf. Most people have heard of Beowulf, and you may have even read a modern English translation of Beowulf. But Beowulf is one of those stories that is highly susceptible to the lightning machine effect, to uh, associative coherence. It's a medieval story about a Scandinavian warrior who fights monsters and dragons and discovers buried treasure. That makes the text of the Old English poem susceptible to all the conventions of the modern day fantasy genre. To be fair, much of the fantasy genre grew out of the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, like Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. And Tolkien was an Old English scholar. Uh, he knew Beowulf inside and out. He drew a lot of inspiration from Beowulf and other Old English and Old Norse literature. But that doesn't mean that familiarity with fantasy games and novels is going to help us understand Beowulf. In fact, it's likely to get in the way. Uh, the same goes for Beowulf movies. There have been many. One even put Beowulf on a spaceship. Uh, there's the 2006 uh, Beowulf movie with Angelina Jolie as Beowulf's mother. There's a, a TV show called Beowulf Return to the Shield Lands that has next to nothing to do with the poem. All these visual adaptations had to make a decision about what Grendel looks like. That's because the poem Beowulf doesn't tell us. It tells us he had glowing eyes and sharp claws, and from a distance he and his mother looked vaguely human. But that leaves a lot for the director to fill in. Was he a zombie type creature like the 2006 movie? Uh, was he something more like an ogre? Uh, was he just a big guy? Uh, whatever images we uh, 21st century readers have in our heads, they're probably not something the poem's early audience would have recognized. 
So we want to try to step away from our modern preconceptions when we approach a text like that. However we decide to imagine Grendel, we have to be aware of the difference between what the text says and what we imagine. We have to recognize what's not in the text as well as what is. Every text leaves the reader a lot of gaps to fill in. If we're reading for enjoyment, we can fill those gaps any way we want, but as literary scholars, and for the purposes of this class, that's what you are, uh, as literary scholars, we have to be careful to interpret the text according to its earlier context. That's why it's important to distinguish between three different concepts, the text, its context, and the subtext. The text consists of the words that are on the page. In Beowulf, that means the Old English words and the only manuscript that we have uh, found that tells the Beowulf story. Only having one manuscript actually makes it easy to isolate one text from others. Other texts we're going to read get a lot trickier because they're compiled from fragments. But even with Beowulf, we'll be reading a translation which, by its very nature, inserts concepts and interpretations that are far into the original. Still, the text you'll be reading won't tell us what Grendel looked like or what Beowulf looked like for that matter. Uh, we'll have gaps to fill in uh, using the historical context. So for your first reading, which is going to be Atrahasis, you'll enter a world in which personal context is going to be about as far from the historical context as you can get. Uh, and yet, you'll find a story in that text that's probably pretty familiar. So before you begin your reading, click on Unit 2 and watch the video introduction. In it, I'll explain some of the historical context that will help make your reading experience a little bit easier. Because in this text, you're going to have a lot of gaps to fill in. Uh, gaps that are marked on the page uh, because these texts come from broken fragments and gaps are all we have. So it's going to be a great introduction to the gap filling process. And that's why the historical context is going to help out.